Hello and welcome to Channels, the Next Flow podcast. This is episode 34 going out on April 2024. My name is Phil Yules. I'm a senior product manager at Secura, working with Nextflow, MultiQC, Wave, and the open source tools we develop at Secura. And today I'm very excited to invite Jacob onto the podcast. Um, Jacob, welcome. <laughs> thanks. Thanks for having me. Um, it's been uh, it's been great to plan this um, since we met last uh, year at the um, at the summit in Barcelona. So I'm really excited for this episode. Exactly. I was going to say that it's been a, it's been a long time coming. Um, it seems like an age ago that we were sat stood stood chatting about this in the foyer, but we finally managed to um, pin a date down and, and get you on the show, which is great. Yeah. Um, so tell us a little bit about your background. You're you're one of a few people, kind of, I guess using Nextflow not with genomics or so. I think it's really interesting to kind of hear a little bit about um, how you came to use Nextflow and, and how it's useful. But first, tell us about yourself. Yeah, happy to. Um, so I'm Jacob Seitler and I'm uh, the head of R&D, I would say, at Matterhorn Studio. And at Matterhorn Studio, um, uh, we're trying to bring machine learning to material science. Um, and for my personal background, um, I'm finishing my, my PhD at UCL, so University College uh, London in London. Um, and so that was in machine learning. Uh, and it's something called efficient experimentation, I would call it, also known as Bayesian optimization. Um, and so during my PhD, I, I got to uh, work with a um, company in the material science space. And um, uh, they were building a really interesting material. They've been running experiments for 20, 30 years. Um, and uh, they kind of uh, were, were getting a little bit to the um, diminishing returns of the theory and intuition. So when you make a new material, um, you know, you um, kind of have to adjust the temperature in the oven or chemical A and chemical B, what's the ratios and so forth. And you could go into a laboratory and just, um, you know, play around a little bit. And that's also known as alchemy, I guess. But usually you want to go a little bit more structured in there. And yeah, uh, there are established statistical methods and there are newer machine learning methods such as Bayesian optimization. Um, so and so what, what, yeah. what kind of materials are you talking about here? Is this kind of like plastics or ceramics or? Yeah, yeah, it's um, actually any kind of material. So um, at the moment, we, we focus on the material space because um, there's kind of like um, a bit of momentum to bring these methods and and the kind of, I don't want to say re revolutionize, but like update and, and, and advance the way experiments are currently run. Um, but we're talking anywhere from like um, solid state chemistry. So that's just like kind of powder stuff that has certain properties um, uh, to um, yeast cells. So right now um, we're starting experiments in, in Munich on yeast cells um, where you feed the nitrogen and carbon just like a human. But with those yeast cells, you kind of want to create sustainable fuel. So kind of like a bio-based synthetic stuff. Um, there's also alloys, um, uh, there's very popular ones. So in alloys, you also have to mix together different metals to create uh, different kind of properties. So anywhere where, where you're experimenting, really, Bayesian optimization applies. Um, and uh, so, yeah, that's that's all across the board, really. It's in, in a way really interesting to talk to so many different companies and see the parallels and differences to how materials are being developed. Um, but yeah, any, anything anything goes, really. Yeah. So, so, I mean, presumably this kind of field has been around for a long time. You know, people have been experimenting with with um, with with new materials for <laughs> as long as we've been around, I guess. Yeah. I mean, uh, how how big is this field? Like, I mean, are there lots of companies doing this? Is it, you know? Um, well, in, in terms of material science, I mean, um, I don't know the exact numbers, but the last time I checked and, and talked with a person in, uh, in the U.S., they have obviously the NSF... Um, uh, unit. So that's the biggest uh, research funding from the government, I think. Material science takes the majority of the funding. Um, and th that kind of makes sense um, because materials kind of, I guess, run the world, like ev everything around us is some kind of material. Um, and so, you know, there are different incentives, I guess, you know, a, a much, much uh, a big one and increasing one right now is sustainability, of course. Um, so this, uh, what I find interesting, this idea like that a lot of uh, uh, materials are over-engineered. So like they're actually too, too good. And because they're so good, they require a lot of energy to make, but we don't need them to be the good. Like Im imagine, a, I guess, a chair made of titanium. Well, we, we don't do that, right? Because it's expensive and we don't need a chair to be so strong, right? So 
um, a lot of things can be toned down a little bit, but we we often have maybe materials that have just been made really extremely good. Um, but that that's one area there. So like, how can we make materials that are more sustainable? Switch out certain maybe even you know toxic or poisonous or uh, bad materials with other ones while maintaining the performance. So sustainability one is one thing. Then obviously high performance is another thing. Um, I guess you know uh, the defense sector um, of course also has huge investments in materials. So a lot of things I think come from the military and then into kind of civil usage and uh, you know all these like hyper fast jets and planes and that can't be detected you know like this stuff is kind of like material design as well um, and yeah so it's a uh, it's an evolving space I mean you know uh, there was a recent story from MIT um, where a lab was trying to create concrete that can store energy um, and that that's a really cool idea but actually the inspiration for their work is partially from the Romans because the Romans were already creating really strong concrete and also something called self-healing concrete, where I think I might admit this very wrong, but like the cracks appear, but then water comes in, but that water then chemically reacts with what's in the concrete and it heals it up again. And that, you know, that that's pretty sophisticated, but you know, that was the Romans back then already. So yeah, materials have been around all the time. Good at concrete. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, and but, I mean, uh... Yeah, my, my, my wife's a, a structural engineer, so I spend a, a lot more time talking about concrete than your average person. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, she, she has probably a whole bunch of stories uh, in that regard. <laughs> yeah, and concrete is actually also um, one of the big projects we're moving into actually right now. So we got funding from the UK government to develop these kind of machine learning methods for the concrete sector. Um, right. uh, and so this year we're spending the majority of our efforts um, on, on that project um, to make sure that we can bring these methods into developing new kinds of concrete. We're actually not alone there. Um, uh, Facebook slash Meta had uh, just published a project last year okay. um, in December, and we got to chat to the office there already. Um, and you, there's, you... there's not like an extreme amount you can do, um, but like if you can do 10, 20% on concrete production in terms of energy efficiency, you're making a huge global impact. I was going to say that because you talked about sustainability. I mean, concrete is, is a huge driver of CO2 emissions and things. Uh, right, exactly. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Sorry, I kind of dragged you off topic into interesting anecdotes about material science. But <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, this, this, can, this can go on forever. But um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, to, to, to sum up my background there. So we're, we're building, uh, you know, this platform and we're building these these algorithms and trying to bring really like the cutting edge a basin mm -hmm. optimization into material science labs around the world um and so yeah so just just draw that bridge between your your phd and, and what you're doing now and then so your phd was on computational or, or mathematical methods then around this and, and it was in, on machine learning probabilistic statistical data modeling methods um so uh that yeah and so bringing those into a lab um, and that's maybe helpful to mention here that there's obviously just the data driven methods and then there are the computational methods. So there's something called like molecular dynamics or DFT. These are physically inspired methods where you kind of simulate a nanosecond of a material behavior. And that gives you an idea of how good it behaves um, to a certain degree. So it, it will give you a number that correlates roughly with the real world performance based on quantum physics or something like that. I did not do this. I don't have much um, knowledge about the intricacies of it. But in fact, actually, it is quite relevant to um, the next flow um, pipelines because what you can do, what people already are doing, is in fact, you know, they, they'll have a machine learning kind of model and that they merge with a, a physical inspired model. And so these could be just two next flow tasks, right? Um, and uh, you define the inputs and then come the outputs. And that's how you define the pipeline. Um, and so this is actually, yeah, we're getting right into it, but this is how one of the usages there. So we'll, we'll have um, these computational tasks, um, you know, uh, for material science where we um, want to schedule maybe a next experiment where we have to calculate it. And we can just go the data driven way or we can merge it with a physically inspired way. There's a really nice paper from 2022 um, where they were looking at high entropy alloys. Um, and they um, had a data-driven part with machine learning, and then they had, um, I think, a DFT part with thermodynamics. And so they could have easily just used the next whole pipeline, but they, they didn't. Um, so instead, they would have just a bunch of scripts flying around, I guess. <laughs> um, and familiar. so, 
Yeah, <laughs> very much so. And so material science, in, in, in a sense, can learn still a lot from bioinformatics. Um, quite quite a bit behind, but you know, I guess there's also a chance to leapfrog because with Nextplot having been developed so long in bioinformatics, material science can actually just adopt that. Um, yeah. yeah. I think this is, I mean, obviously an interesting discussion that comes up every now and then, like Nextflow doesn't, it's been adopted by the bioinformatics community, but there's nothing about it which is intrinsically locked to that. It just is a workflow manager that works well with big files. Um, yeah. So it's exciting to see it starting to get some adoption in other fields. Yeah. So then tell us a little bit about Matterhorn Studio. Um, where did it come from? How, did, how does this fit in? What, what's the background of the company there? Yeah, so the, the background is basically that um, through the PhD, um, I, I studied a lot of the Bayesian optimization methods. Um, and, you know, the, at UCL, that the, um, PhD program is very theoretically focused. Um, and uh, I realized that um, we have a, a whole movement of material scientists that want to use these methods, but they um, uh, don't necessarily uh, have the training or the time to make um, the best use of them. So these, these methods, um, they can be used off the shelf, but they just wouldn't be that effective. So there would need to be some some level of tailoring to the problem. The, every machine learning model has you know a few knobs where you can tune it, um, some choices you can make where you can align it more with the problem space. Um, and so the the idea was really to bring the best kind of Bayesian optimization to material science um, and make sure that we also you know kind of just raise the average level of of, of Bayesian optimization use in material science. And so that company Matterhorn Studio is supposed to do that. So Matterhorn, it would be matter and horn, which is like the peak of materials. Um, and so that's inspired from the first customer we have in, in Switzerland. Um, uh, and so with that company, we're driving that forward. Um, there's a few other researchers in the world that um, are doing that in the academic setting. Um, uh, at the University of Buffalo, there's Christopher Reese or Marcus and Noah, who have very uh, concrete ideas, you know, of what needs to be improved right now in material science and how they use machine learning. Uh, and so we're basically trying to provide the tools to make that possible. And one of the tools is built on, on top of uh, Nextflow uh, Secure platform. Um, uh, and that, <laughs> yeah, I was, I was about to say tower, but um, yeah, so uh, just about safe there. Um, and, uh, yeah, so that, 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 that is kind of like last year when I met, uh, M Marcel, um, uh, uh, who, um, had a conversation back then who, um, we, we just met at a lunch table at the conference, you know, completely irrelevant conference. It was his master's project. Uh, it was a completely different topic for me, for my PhD and I'm chatting to him and, um, he's telling me about, you know, this thing called next flow and how you can like execute pipelines and just define the inputs and outputs and then it just works and i'm just sitting there and i've been like for months been like looking for a solution how to do this in the smartest bestest way and he tells me like in less than five minutes how the whole thing works <laughs> <laughs> so i come back from the conference like the first day and immediately get into like trying to understand how it works and there's the machine learning example um actually on the next floor page and again as mm -hmm. you say like next floor is not at all limited to bioinformatics like it's a it's a very um how do you say unopinionated um uh, approach in a way um and so i just went straight in there and i was like slightly you know distracted by all the bioinformatics stuff but i saw the machine learning example and i was like okay let's let's just test it let's see how it goes um nice. marcel so gave me a really impressive yeah sorry so I was going to say we need more examples then. We need to kind of lean on you and others in the yeah, yeah. fields to come up with some different spread. We are we are working on that so that there's a, there's there's more to come in that regard. Um, but yeah, so I went through the machine learning example and I was like, this seems straightforward. Um, and then um, even more so, I realized that the um, the, the platform is is particularly um, useful for us. Um, so mm -hmm. the way we used it technically there is that the platform has obviously the API access. And I, I just define, you know, my um, AWS environment, um, define a workflow. And then so on, on our platform, on our platform, well, on our software side, you know, Matterhorn Studio uses half the data and then they can choose an algorithm, but actually every algorithm is just a next full pipeline. And when they press run, it triggers a run on the tower. And then that 
and sorry tower it triggers a run on the platform <laughs> um and that um platform um will trigger it obviously on the aws on the aws we'll have our machine learning code that will pull from our api the data do the calculations you know gives us all the monitoring and then when it, once it's finished it will push the data back on our platform and um, you know the new recommended experiments that is um mm -hmm. And then give us all the meta uh, data on the calculations of the experiments and how the machine learning went. Um, and we can split that obviously up in different tasks. So there could be a data cleaning task that you know triggers some Python stuff. And obviously that can be combined with all kinds of other molecular dynamics calculations. Um, and then you know once it's finished, platform just informs us if the API is finished, and we can present that clean to the user. So the user never has to fully engage you know with the next flow thing, but they can. Because every every opt app, we call them optimization apps, um, they can just go to the GitHub repo and just check it out and clone it, right? And so that's that's the great thing of that is that if we want to, you know, you know, up the level of Bayesian optimization, it needs to be obviously um, transparent. And what what's more transparent than a GitHub repo that you can clone and fork and make adjustments to? Um, and so that that's kind of like the very deep technical part of Meta and Studio. Yeah. So, I mean, tell us a bit more about this kind of approach to open source. So, I mean, Matterhorn Studio, you're a commercial company, um, presumably, but so who's writing their workflows? Are they kind of community generated workflows or, or are you yourselves writing these or how does that Yeah. Work? So it's, it's, it's a mix so at, at the moment it's actually still just, um, Matterhorn Studio that that's pushing, uh, effectively these opt apps. So there's, um, there's a whole bunch of algorithms out there and some build on top of each other and others are completely new, others are outdated, but some people are very opinionated and they want to have, uh, you know, their own kind of algorithms and others are just like, do it for my, for, for me. Um, and so, um, we are at the moment still building up, you know, a nice kind of like base level of algorithms that, um, that people can use. Facebook um, is uh, slash Meta is developing by far the best um, uh, Bayesian optimization framework right now, and so um, we're trying to bring that onto the platform with all the customizations it has, and that's obviously our developing part. But by definition um, of of the opt store, we call it an opt store, but everything's free. <laughs> um, is is that uh, any any pipeline can be just you know forked and cloned and then submitted to the opt store, um, and then made available to run there. Uh, so um, people and so, can bring their own oh, pipelines as well. Exactly. For for that's exactly the idea. And people, more importantly, can also take the pipeline off the platform. You know, if they're like, I don't want to run this on the cloud. I want to run it on premise. You know, like no no one's stopping you there. We're, we're we're hoping to provide the best kind of pipeline running and development environment. But if for whatever reason you don't need that, well, with the next flow standard, you are not limited at all, right? Um, you could just take the code and go, and that, that's perfectly fine. Um, so yeah. But coming back to one of the things you touched on when earlier as well, I mean, I want to point out as one of the things I really kind of love about Secure Platform is it's entirely API driven. So everything you see through the, when you're clicking around is being driven by a, an API, and that we have an open API spec, so you can just sort of see all the endpoints. Um, I was messing around with it the other day of. We've got this kind of side project, SRA Explorer, and sort of it's my first proper effort to try and build something into it. But um, yeah. it sounds like you and I know many other people are kind of building, using Secure Platform as a kind of building brick underneath something in an invisible way. Um, I mean, what what led you to that? Like, how's that experience been for you? Um, how's the experience been? Um, I mean, e exciting. I still remember the first time I got the whole workflow working, you know? You, you, you first obviously you get started with Nextflow, and you run it on the command line, right? And then you're like, okay, now I can use that graphical user interface uh, to, you know, click some buttons and run some workflows and put it together. Um, and then you find the API and you look through it and you're like, okay, so I can do all of this by API. And then you have your own product, you know, in my case, like Bayesian optimization pipelines for materials. And it's very specific, right? And I'm like, well, I don't want the user. The, the user is never going to learn all about Nextflow, right? In the first instance, in the beginning. So how do I make it most easiest for them? Well, if they press a button start and I just do all the API handling, that's pretty cool. So once I had ready and I could click start and it like, it just takes the pipeline and puts it on the server and it runs and it pushes stuff. It, it was great. Um, so it was a, a great um, kind of like a, achievement in that regard. Um, and 
the the API was you know because of the open API spec self explanatory. Um, I don't think I don't think I had to consult the community once to be honest. It was it was uh, <laughs> maybe I had one. <laughs> Say again. That's a win. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it's it's. Mm. Yeah, I, I think I played around with once. I think I confused one of the namespaces once. Um, I think workflow and, and task or something like that. Um, but, uh, you, you know, you, you just build up to it. And um, it probably was harder to set up, like, the right AWS credentials than the API, to be honest. So um, the challenges were, were not with the actual API. Um, but, I mean, I, I know that, obviously, for myself, I'm a, I'm a very, like... Um, Kind of like how do you say that like cowboy programmer so i just like jump in and like just throw requests and see what happens and get a feeling for it you know like it, it's it, it works just like that so um as documentation gets added to that it will get even easier to get started um yeah, uh, yeah so i know it, there it, are a lot great. of plans to improve the documentation in this year so hopefully that mm. will get easier but it's still fun to hear about your experiences <laughs> yeah and, yeah and it was it was great to see like um the platform being updated like while I was working on it. So I would see like new features appear while I was developing and integrating the API. So I, it wasn't just like a stale kind of like platform where you're like, is this API broken or not? Or is it just me or is it them? Like it was clearly, if things didn't work, it was most likely myself because I could see that, you know, things were being actively developed. So, um, yeah. <laughs> That's cool. And, and <laughs> when you, you talk about AWS, so you're you just kind of you have your own Matterhorn AWS account, and all of yeah. your kind of customers run on that account, and you charge them indirectly, I guess. Is that kind of rough? Yeah, more or less. Right? So at the moment, we don't actually even charge. Um, but yeah, I mean, the, the costs are actually too small because, um, again, like we're using we're not about informatics. We don't necessarily have huge runtimes. So like the runtime of a, a, a Bayesian optimization pipeline is, is negligible. But yeah, okay. Well, you've led me very nicely onto one of the next topics, which I am mm -hmm. kind of curious about how the characteristics of these pipelines kind of look and how maybe they're different, differ to people in the community, what, what people are used to. I mean, when we talk about some kind of DNA sequencing pipeline, it, it often takes hours, if not even days to run. We're talking about kind of hundreds of gigabytes of, of data in and out. Um, is that, it sounds like your, your workflows are maybe kind of different. Um, talk us through kind of how that looks. Yeah, so it, it's definitely different, and and at times you could you know talk of an abuse of how we use Nextflow, um, <laughs> but the, the fact is like you know if if we use it and it works, like there must be something to it, right? So um, de definitely, like we don't at the moment have huge you know um, data coming in, but um, that doesn't necessarily you know the reason um, why using the Nextflow pipelines is so attractive. Is because of the structure it brings. You know, it's it's not necessarily like the throughput it allows and the, the definition of the inputs and outputs. That's good to like force people to be structured. Um, and so the the thing is though, going ahead, right? Once people you know would use Nextflow pipelines, it would be much better for them to be structured. And then when they add, for example, molecular dynamics to it, which can take also days to run, um, you know, it's already available it's ready and too good to go there um and so you know it's it's um establishing a standard is, is hard work over many years but you you, you got to start at some point um and so we we think that with these smaller calculations with machine learning um at least i mean machine learning itself can also be long at times but the machine learning we do is definitely not the, the long kind of running machine learning um we can um make sure that that fund fun foundations are set for people to use those pipelines in the long you know in the right structured way yeah. <laughs> the fact is room, actually that we do scale so again sorry so i just saying like kind of room to grow and, and scale in the future yeah kind of thing. yeah like again you know buying we're all just doing computation right so surely there's something about how bioinformaticians have been mixing scripts and trying to make it structured over the last 10 years that also applies to material science, right? So um, uh, the, the way this, uh, you know, the pipelines are structured in a general way is, is of course, going to translate to computational tasks in material science. Yeah. Um, and, and, and so, do you have a, what, how about the number of tasks? Because I've, I've heard about some people who have got, you know, short running tasks of a few seconds, but maybe they have 10 million of them and they want to mm. run, run them all in power. Is that the kind of thing you're, you're working on as well? Or are you, is that not an issue? 
Yeah, so we have just single task pipelines, but for example, I, I um, we have this one customer and um, it was kind of my test of like how, you know, easy is Nextflow to use. And I just like, we had this code running already locally. And then it was, I was like, well, you know, Daniel, um, who, who, who works in the customer project, I was like, can you turn this into an Nextflow pipeline? And so he sat down. And I didn't say anything. <laughs> and like a couple hours later, he comes back and he actually was using the tasks, you know, inputs and outputs. So I was like, well, you could have done this just all into like one script and one task. But he actually wanted to, you know, define the, you know, the the data cleaning step and the um, calculation step and so forth um, uh, separately. So he just picked it up naturally and just implemented it there. And now we have some granularity of the task, you know, what's maybe going wrong and some monitoring and yeah so like that that kind of developed naturally there um and so the the biggest the longest running task is the the final task of the calculation um but the, we're still speaking of less like a minute it, it depends how we do it um so in machine learning you can go you know as crazy as you want but uh you know there's a trade-off so like at the moment we've set it to like a fast calculation but this could also take uh you know more than an hour if we wanted to and then we can just spin it up and we can just be, you know, you know, there's this low risk for us to monitor it because platform is monitoring it, AWS batch is monitoring, and we'll, we'll have great introspection of when it goes wrong. So we literally pull the log files automatically uh, on failure from platform um, and just display it on our platform so we can see it straight away. Very cool. And are you using CPUs here or GPUs or I don't know, anything else more exotic? Yeah, so at the moment we're just focusing on the CPUs. So, you know, we need to focus in, in many ways. In theory, we could use GPUs. Uh, we haven't looked into that. So, Bowtorch, which is this, you know, very established framework for Bayesian optimization from Facebook, and it's built on PyTorch. And PyTorch has GPU acceleration. Uh, and in theory, you could enable that, you know, with some fiddling and plumbing. It just if, hasn't. If your been... tasks are only a few seconds long, when I guess there's not really much better yeah, than optimizing yeah. at this point. There are, there are, so the, there's, a, there's a few scenarios in the future where this might become quite relevant. Um, so we might be looking into running benchmarks um, online on, on Amazon. And so to support that uh, feature, so, so benchmarks effectively is like taking a test function and stress testing your algorithm, how well it's working on a synthetic problem. And so there you're not running the algorithm one time, you know, to get one recommendation, but you're running it a hundred times. And mm -hmm. so obviously suddenly 10 times, a, you know, 10 seconds, a hundred times, 10 seconds turns into a lot of runtime. So mm -hmm. with GPUs in, in theory, you could maybe accelerate that quite significantly. I was going to ask that about it within your workflows as well, whether you kind of have, we've talked about benchmarking in, in NF core as well and kind of parameter optimization and things like this kind of having recur recursion steps within the workflow to try and find the, the sweet spot um, mm. is that something you, you're gonna you looked at or is that kind of a bit off topic? we we haven't looked at that yet um, but that is a good idea <laughs> <laughs> so the um, the benchmarking we do for for now is still very much local you know you're looking at a um, at a Jupyter notebook, maybe, or some Python code, and then you just maybe put it on a more high-performing machine, and then you get the outputs. That's, it's, it's very manual at the moment. But as we try to bring maybe benchmarking onto Matterhorn Studio long-term, uh, certainly kind of like utilizing these kind of recursive uh, task definitions could be, become quite attractive, yeah. Nice. Um, so, of course, I'm a bit biased with, with my background and everything with NF Core, and I, I think I, I watched your um, your summit talk again the other day just to refresh my memory, and I think you got a question <laughs> at the end of your talk about this as well. I mean, yeah. you're you're effectively kind of building community pipelines by the sound of it, or you'd like to with with your open source. Yeah. Do you how how do you kind of see that kind of community involvement? Is it something um, that you, you could you could see us collaborating on in the future, or is it live better by itself? Or? It's it's uh, undetermined in the moment, as as um, frankly, like the material science, um, you know, the machine learning community is still quite quite small and developing, um, and so I don't know where people will go, but presumably I can very much envision a world um, where we, you know, have a community where we can share knowledge between the bioinformaticians and material scientists. 
um, I, I don't know uh, where the the limits are of transferring knowledge there. Um, but the, I think the first step we need is first to the material scientists to start to appreciate the, the benefit of pipelines. Um, mm. So for, for us, it's it's been pretty clear and easy because with platform, we get so much, you know, headaches and, and risks taken away. So this is no no brainer. But that's not mm. true for, you know, certain academic settings. Um, and so, uh, you know, we first need to kickstart the kind of like community just to appreciate pipelines. And then we can also bring them to like, you know, maybe closer to bioinformatics. It might just naturally happen. So I would hope that, um, you know, when people see how we use Nextflow, that they'll get interested to check out the Nextflow community, check out the, you know, uh, the forums um, on the bioinformatics stuff and then realize, you know, what they can learn and take away from that. But I, th I think we're we're still quite a bit far away from that um, just because even like thinking about pipelines isn't a paradigm that's established yet. There are a few yeah. people, especially in molecular dynamics, I think that would get it first. Um, and so they're playing around with tools other than Nextflow as well. Um, I think like it's something called Snake Make or something like that. Um, <laughs> so I've seen a few use that, um, but um, the 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 whole community still needs to come around that that's really it so i can't i can't make a prediction here really <laughs> mm. um you, yeah. you preempted my next question which was um if you'd had any kind of dipped your toes into any other workflow managers um snake makers another one obviously from bioinformatics community there's also yeah. um kind of other ones which maybe come from other domains like uh, apache airflow or um, yeah there are many others is, is they did you kind of look at any of these other tools and kind of compare or I, I did, I did. It was, it was a, you know, like as a, as a small company that's, you know, making decisions about where to put a, a very limited time and resources. I did look at, uh, you know, the differences, and to to one degree, of course, I'm I'm biased in the sense that when you get to talk to an actual person in in person, um, you're like building very quick trust and you're like i can actually ask this person questions all day and they're not going to hate me <laughs> so in one degree i was like i'm definitely going to use Nextflow because um you know the the, the access to like debugging is very fast and it, it wasn't actually at the end you know marcel or anyone um that i initially met from Nextflow that helped me but it was the slack forum so um i went into um when did when the slack um is it the yeah, the slack channel for Nextflow? And so I had a bunch of questions on runtime for AWS Batch, and I just threw in the questions there. And people were so, I, I'm not trying to like promote and make this look nice, but generally people answered so fast and were super helpful and also funny. Um, and so that, that kind of uh, ultimately won me over is that, you know, especially if you have, you know, any kind of experience like working with frameworks and stuff like that, the number one thing um the number one key indicator of whether you should invest your time or not is the community and the documentation um and so once i saw that like that you know that channel was hyperactive and like you know turnaround time of minutes um i was like okay th this this makes sense you know i'm i'm not gonna bother like looking into these other possibly stale looking solutions when i know that i have always people here that i can ask questions so i did look at them and compare them and it, it kind it came down to community it always comes down to community for myself um mm -hmm. you know i've spent a lot of time developing ruby on rails um and django and and ios and stuff like that and ios of course with apple you get great documentation um with um, uh, django and ruby on rails you also get take take great documentation but the reason for example why in the last years i've switched more and more to django over ruby on rails is because just the community in django is so much wider because it's built on python so you can load just so many python packages at any point in time it saves you so much time um and so the, the same way I, from a first estimation when i was comparing you know solutions and community i felt like um next was, was uh, most active uh, and therefore, um, you know, most useful in the future for me when problems appear, because they always do. <laughs> yeah. So finding a solution for that um, seemed seemed the easiest uh, to do in Nextflow. Um, mm -hmm. Again, might be biased because I already like kind of like knew how to join the Slack channels and stuff like that. But of course, no one else is, is prevented from joining those or going on the forum. Um, mm -hmm. And so I guess that's what I would recommend is like compare the communities, how active they are. and 
how how close the access is to people that know how to fix things and um for me that was that, that was clearly next flow in that regard that does okay. I, I don't have much information on the technical comparison which I, which i also looked into got a few opinions um but um at that point i had already been like halfway into like learning about next flow running the examples and stuff like that didn't encounter any big stuff problems. was already working <laughs> yes that was working I, I you know why yeah. it ain't broke you know don't fix don't it fix. <laughs> so, yeah. I, I mean i think we, we i hear similar kind of stories from people a lot you know that there's there's not necessarily parity but there's there's a lot of overlap between the kind yeah. of capabilities of these different tools and so things like community are really key and i think i mean I've told the story before about it was the same when I started using Nextflow years ago and the community was only a handful of people. But um, even back then, the, we didn't use Slack, we used Gitter. But, you know, Paolo, the main author of Nextflow, would would always reply seemingly any time of night or, night or day. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it makes yeah, it makes a huge difference. And, and we're hoping to provide, you know, the kind of same level of like, um, you know, support or community for the material science. And that's yeah. developing right now as well. So we have, for example, a hackathon. I mean, hackathons are huge momentum pushes, right? But in yeah. two weeks time, at the end of March, there will be a hackathon for Bayesian optimization. Um, and um, uh, I, think, I think we're gonna maybe get around 100 people together. So this is a joint effort with um, Merck, funny enough. Right. Um, and um, uh, the escalation consortium and um it's a testing ground for us to see how people react to pipelines um and so um I've already now before the hackathon started seeing people ask questions like oh how how are we going to supposed to you know what's the best way to share my algorithm and like i'm like oh my god you know like i comment under there and i'm like well you could use like a pipeline structure how about that you know take a look at this and so right now i'm like trying to see you know how um how people react to this idea um and so yeah it's 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 a genuine it's a genuine problem you know you have you have every what every year but every month now it, it seems someone's publishing an algorithm it's a python you know it's it's a python code repository in github maybe not cleaned up nicely you download it the packages the packages you don't match maybe you know all the headaches right if this thing was a pipeline you could literally run it with, you know, a single line uh, on, on your command line. You could you mm. could do it if it was a pipeline, if people adopted the standard. Yeah. So, I mean, you mentioned Python there, like that's that's one thing that comes up when when you ask people kind of what 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 things slow people down in their adoption of Nextflow. And, you know, Groovy comes up a lot. The fact that Nextflow mm. is this DSL built into Groovy. Um, presumably, most of the stuff that you're putting into your pipelines is is Python. Mm. And I had a podcast episode the other day with um, Josh. We were kind of talking about how they use kind of Python scripts within their processes and how they pass metadata around. And yeah. have you found that kind of to be a, an issue, or is it just it's not really been a problem? Uh, honestly, no problem. <laughs> uh, it it just works. Um, again, not trying to sell how easy it was, but like I mean. The, the machine learning example on the next flow page at the you know just go on next flow page and find the examples find the machine it works you know like it's it is just python um that's executed in in a container there's there's no magic to it in that regard it's just like um you know um it's just much better structured and um yeah, I mean, would be the, the, there was there was no issue as such. I mean, the issues was more on our side, maybe like not choosing, you know, packages consistently, something like that. We did have to do one hack. Um, that's maybe because we don't know how to <laughs> properly use um, the file system access. And again, that's why I'm saying like um, sometimes we might be more abusing than using Nextflow. So I think we've broken one design paradigm which was how to access files because we just kind of wanted to like access our own files. And um, the, in theory, you should be loading that in the proper next flow way. Um, but we kind of just like wanted it directly there. So we've, we've kind of like, you know, did some working directory access uh, shenanigans to, to load some files that were somewhere else in the directory. Um, but um, apart from that, you know, you just define your task, input, output. You say, you know, Python, run the script with some options. And it works. I mean, we, we have, you know, fancy stuff going on. We're passing parameters um, inside the Python script. We have, uh, you know, an API package that is using those parameters to access, you know, databases and, and other 
you know, IP zones, like, um, you know, it, it could be breaking in many parts, but it, um, it doesn't, as long as you define, you know, your Docker container or your packages in the right way. And in fact, we um, locally, I sometimes develop with a Conda environment and then on production, we run a Docker container. And as long as those things are consistent, by definition, it doesn't break. And that, so that's actually very, very important to us because um, for the transparency of developing these machine learning algorithms, um, uh, we also obviously need to make sure that the packages are consistent throughout. Um, and mm -hmm. so that's actually a huge, uh, huge feature um, for us um, that, that that is clearly Imagine. defined and people are forced you know, to define it. Yeah, that's nice. Exactly. When you when you can pin exact versions and you know that everyone running this this version of yep. the pipeline is running the same version of the software. Absolutely. Hugely important, yeah. And have you come across kind of any other people in the next phase space developing similar pipelines or are you kind of a number one pioneer? Um, I haven't come across anyone yet. You know, if, if someone's out there, please get in touch, We're hope, hoping <laughs> to learn from each other. But um, yeah, we're really excited to see um, where this goes, you know, it does feel pioneering in some way. Um, but, uh, the, you know, the indicator we, we come back to is that it works for us, right? It, yeah, it just it works for us. I don't know why I should change it. You know, other people might come by and they're like, you could use this solution, you know, you could simplify this, but I'm like, no, I, wa I want structured pipelines. I want a platform to help me manage AWS batch. Um, you know, I, I want uh, to be able to create different tasks uh, and I want the Docker containers to be clearly defined and so forth. So yeah. at the moment, I don't see any reason to do it much differently um, in, in, yeah, in the foreseeable future. Nice. Um, so tell us a bit more. So Matter, Matterhorn is, is how big is the company in and kind of where what's where are you now and where's what's your tra trajectory in terms of kind of yeah projects so and scope and we're based in in oxford here you know i've been around for two years um i guess every every year is bigger than the one before um so with the grant right now we're, we're hiring two more full-time developers which is which is going to be just really exciting um and um hoping to just develop further the platform. These two developers will be working on the next flow parts of it. We have to do a, a database um, upgrade. Um, and then once that, you know, we, we need to switch from a, you know, one database to another one. Um, once that's done, I'm, I'm gonna, you know, send off one developer to like go crazy on the API and squeeze as much mon monitoring information out of, of the platform as possible. Um, and then just to kind of like streamline and, and clarify um, how opt apps can be developed. Um, and then um, we hope to, you know, continue to work with more and more laboratories um, around the world and, and see how Bayesian optimization can be brought to them. So the, the, the thing that we provide really, um, the, the, the value proposition there is that, you know, you, uh, we, we can build an algorithm for your laboratory um, that's customized and works, you know, the best with your kind of material. And then you can run it 24 seven without asking us, right? <clears throat> because you go on, on the Matterhorn studio platform, you, um, log in, you have your data, you have access to all your algorithms, including the one that we built for you. Um, and then you press start and it triggers the run and you never have to mm -hmm. call us again. You don't have to email us, you know, it, it just works. Um, you do that calculation. Um, and so this this is where Nextflow comes in handy because you know it just takes away all the risk of like how to implement this and things breaking because all I do is send a Git URL you know with some maybe secret uh, private keys to tower uh, not tower to platform <laughs> and they will do the calculation and inside that calculation it will send back uh, results to our API and that's it um, you know I will never have to worry about AWS again. <laughs> that's the hope. <laughs> in theory. <laughs> yeah. Nice. And um, and uh, I kind of realized we probably should have covered more of this in the introduction is kind of how Bayes and optimization works and everything. I, I, maybe yeah. maybe a bit late in the podcast now, but uh, I would say to anyone listening, do check out Jacob's, um, your your talk at the Expo Summit, because I, I, I've watched it a, few, a couple of times now. I think it's, I get a bit scared when people mention words like Bayesian to me, uh, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but I think you broke it down really nicely. Yeah. 
Can, yeah, yeah. Can you give us kind of like a, an elevator pitch over why people want to run these things? And I mean, we talked about optimizing, um, optimizing uh, kind of experiments a little bit, but how how is Bayesian optimization different to other methods, and why is it? Yeah, ha- so happy to. So absolutely, you're right. A, a good reference is just to check out that summit video from 2023. Um, that should be on on YouTube on the next flow channels. But the the rundown here uh, in the podcast is that um, in in the laboratory, let's say you're developing a material, you put it in the oven, you can choose you know the right temperature. Um, so maybe you know it's much more harder if you put it in the oven for 100 degrees compared to 200 degrees because if 200 degrees is too hot, it dries out, it gets brittle and it breaks, and 100 degrees is the optimum one. To find to find that optimum parameter choice, um, uh, you know there are different ways. Number one is you just randomly try it. You know um, it's it's not stupid as such. It can work out quite well. The number two is that you kind of like create a grid. So you say, I take 100, zero to 200 degrees, and I take steps of 20. So I do at zero, at 20, at 40, at 60. And that way you also learn kind of the behavior of the material. And then there's um, the more established classical methods, something uh, called design of experiments. And that's where you kind of pre-calculate a grid to learn about the interaction of variables. So of course, every material, doesn't just you know get influenced by temperature, but it's also a chemical A, chemical B, a certain kind of shaking factor, or how long is this in the oven and so forth. Um, <clears throat> and so all these different parameters will have interactions. So maybe 100 degrees is optimal, but then when you introduce a certain chemical, it might actually go up to 120 degrees. So we need to capture scientifically the interactions between different parameters. And so classical design of experiments can help with that. But when we get to more high dimensional spaces like 20 or 30 dimensions, um, uh, we can also use methods like Bayesian optimization. And so Bayesian optimization is about learning a model, a, a kind of like prediction machine of the behavior and using the uncertainty around these predictions to make a recommendation what experiment to run next. And so, for example, we might um, one time around want to explore. So we, we're going to take areas with high uncertainty. So we can ask the model, where do we not know much? And then it will tell us, well, here I have really no clue. And then you go and run an experiment in these uncertain regions. And then once you collect the data points, you update the model and suddenly these regions aren't uncertain anymore. They're actually very certain, you know, because mm-hmm. now you have the empirical data. And then on the other mode, you can say, I want to exploit. So you can ask it, what are the best points right now? And it might be like, here are three points in the model where you know the material has particularly good performance. It's very, very strong when you use 100 degrees Celsius and 250 degrees Celsius. And then you can be like, okay, let's explore these kind of peaks a little bit more. Mm-hmm. And so it will go to these um, you know, um, certain predictions of peaks and then try to um, you know, modify the parameters a little bit and you know, find a peak that's even higher. Um, around these areas. And so the, it's a trade-off between exploration and exploitation is classical machine learning paradigm anyway. Um, and so Bayesian optimization helps to do that in a high dimensional space. So we can look at graphs, you know, we, we can easily understand data in one, two, and three dimensions. But once you get to four, five, and six, maybe with DOE, you can get an idea, but seven, eight, nine, 10, 20, 30, Good luck visualizing that. So with Bayesian optimization, you can, you know, statistically efficiently navigate this high dimensional space. And so this is something we haven't discussed yet so far, but this becomes particularly attractive in a new kind of um, idea um, that's evolving particularly fast right now, which is called self-driving labs um, or materials acceleration platforms. So if you can take your materials, you know, experimentation setup and you automate it and you close the loop by having you know the experiment done, it then is measured, and then you get the data points. Um, then you can make a decision to run the next experiment. But if your robot finishes at night, it's not going to call you and ask you what to do next. Instead, it can just query, you know, for example, of Matterhorn Studio and the API access for the next Bayesian optimization inspired experiments and continue running, and you know, do that twenty four seven on the weekends at night and so forth. And so that way you can increase the data throughput because the machine learning works better with more data. Um, And you can possibly find new materials we haven't found before because we didn't have the throughput 
um, and we couldn't close the loop because you know with with DOE you pre-calculate and you can do it in some sequential way, but with Bayesian optimization you can do you know um, uh, a closed loop sequential optimization by design. Um, and so um, that's something people may, maybe want to look at. So that's, that's heavy investments going on. We've got 100 million from the Dutch government, I think 200 from Canada. America's ramping up. The UK has also put down quite a few millions in this closed loop optimization. And those closed loop optimizations, either we're going to build them with some random scripts flying around, or we're going to put it into a pipeline, you know, that's structured and that we can share across the labs that are running these self-driving lab setups. Exactly. And so that's the ultimate goal here really is to um, use these pipelines to make sure that we have the best base and optimization across all of these self-driving labs. Yeah. And we're not reinventing the wheel. Exactly. Yeah. Which is literally happening right now, the reinventing of the wheel. Um, so we're trying to prevent that. Yeah. yeah. So if you don't have a closed loop system, and that was, it was kind of my, I'm trying to visualize a little bit how practically, you know, it, it's you, this is all used by someone in the lab. So they, someone would kind of run an experiment by hand, get the results, update the files locally, and then just kind of drop that into Matterhorn Studio, run the next flow pipeline, yeah. which would tell them what to do next. They'd run it and then they'd run the next flow pipeline. So they're kind of manually re rerunning the next, the same next flow pipeline again and again, yeah. each time they've finished the experiment. That's correct. Yeah. So that's literally happening. So. <clears throat> Our first customer in Switzerland, for example, we set them up with that system. They right now can log in at any point in time, press the start button on their, you know, custom opt app we built for them, which is the next full pipeline. Um, it triggers it, pulls it, you know, with the secret API key onto the AWS badge, runs the calculation, you know, pushes the results back onto our database. And they see it there after 10 minutes, um, uh, yeah, and we, we can actually speed that up. So uh, there are some ways to bring this down to like 30 seconds if we really want to. So that's really snappy and really fast. Um, but that's happening right now already. Um, so they can query that at any point in time. They can, they effectively are next flow users, you know, by, by the way this has been designed and um, they can benefit from that. And any point in time, we make a change to the pipeline, push that to the GitHub, they already have it on the on the fingerprints, right? They they did at the tip of the fingers. They can they can just do it. <laughs> yeah. um, and I think I think that's really cool. And that's what the API on the platform enables is that we can trigger those runs um, for them even when we're not around. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. No, I see that a lot. It's kind of the benefit of using hosted services, I guess, isn't it? Kind of software. Absolutely. Yeah. Amazing. So, anything you want to leave us with, kind of you know what what can we expect to see see coming out out of your your group and your your company in the kind of the next kind yeah. of couple of years I, I think on the horizon yeah so so we're really pushing ahead hard with the um with the pipelines like um this could be done in a simpler way for sure like uh we could just you know somehow set up an aws batch and uh somehow just run some python code and i you know this has been proposed and discussed um, but I do, I do think that, um, that like piggybacking on, on, you know, the, a decade of bioinformatics and, and, um, a pipeline system like Nextflow has just much more benefits. You know, you're not custom brewing something, but like you can take advantage of so many features that are available in the Nextflow standard, uh, and integrate that even with the use of the platform of the secure platform. And so I'm just really excited to see how this develops, you know, how we can utilize more and more features um, and, and make things faster. I mean, I'm, I'm still wanting to press that optimize cost button <laughs> in, uh, in the platform. <clears throat> in, in fact, um, it was also through the community that I was able to do some speed ups. Um, I forgot the name of one of the key Nextflow developers, but um, he, he made a funny joke about how, you know, uh, a PhD in bioinformatics is nice, but what really matters is like a PhD in AWS costology. So like figuring <laughs> out these costs is just, um, yeah. it's just uh, really important long-term, of course. Um, and so on the technical side, I'm just really excited to see how we can like, get, you know, get people thinking about pipelines and material uh, science and, um, Maybe it's overkill. Maybe it's overkill. There is a chance that it's overkill. Um, but um, especially if we move into the paradigm of like um, 
merging molecular dynamics, which do take also days, you know, to run um, with these kind of pipelines, then um, I think we actually getting quite a bit of a um, head start here with, with using Nextflow. Mm -hmm. And then sorry. on the strategy, yeah, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say something I meant to sort of discuss earlier, I, I forgot it, was um, about kind of a modularity of these pipelines. And it, it mm. was, seems like you, you were talking about breaking up the different tasks, so having kind of a data cleaning step. And, and I was kind of thinking about whether some of those steps would be shared across different ML pipelines that you've got, you know, where, if the data cleaning is always the same and how that could overlap mm. with kind of the modularity system we have within NF Core and you know, you can then kind of start to collaborate and community drive these these kind of Lego bricks, as I often refer to them as. So you can absolutely, kind of yeah. I mean, steps. I f I feel that too. I feel that too, and it naturally happens, right? Um, and that 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 can naturally happen because we use versioning systems where you can you know rip out code and and share it and compare it. Um, and yeah, so I this is one of the things I can very easily see happening in the future is that like we are streamlining certain parts of the BO process. Um, and that obviously works because it's modular. Um, and you can just take one part and put it there and use it as a starting point, right? It's, it's oftentimes mm -hmm. just a starting point. And then every time the starting point gets a little bit better because someone makes an improvement and, and it gets established. Mm -hmm. um, exactly. So we'll, if, we'll if see. One that person up, if one Sorry, person man. updates that module in a central location, then all the different pipelines using it can all benefit. Yeah, yeah, we especially with our kind of like Botosh opt app, we do have the idea that um, this could be a central place where every, and, and everyone can use this kind of like framework um, easily and use it as a, a starting point. Um, mm -hmm. And then any changes made there, you know, translate to the rest of the community. Um, don't reinvent the wheel, you know, really don't reinvent the wheel in some, in some regards there. Um, yeah, and then for, for Meta and Studio, I mean, Material science has some catching up to do. Um, bioinformatics is, you know, making great leaps. Um, and so I'm hoping that we can, you know, you know, make an impact in terms of sustainable materials, better concrete, you know, um, it's, it's not going to completely remove the impact, but like, you know, a 1% improvement in solar cells translates to huge improvements worldwide and 10% improvement in CO2 emission for concrete also has huge impact. So if we can utilize machine learning to make some contribution to that and do that in a smart and efficient way, because we're structured and we're sharing, we're building a community around it, um, then that makes sense to me as a, as a thing to invest in. Very cool. Inspiring. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm looking yeah. forward to, to uh, kind of working together, hopefully more in the future and, and good luck with hiring those positions. Maybe we can post them in the jobs board on the next place. Slack. <laughs> They're already hired, but we do of course have uh, future positions as well. So do check out our a careers page on Matt on studio. Yeah. Yeah. And, and anyone interested, um, this is, you can kind of Google, I'll put the, the links in the show notes as well, but there's the, the Matt on studio website as well. Um, yeah. Which I guess and so on, on there on the friend page, you can also see the tutorial. So, um, of course, check out the talk at the, the summit, but if you actually want to do that hands on, you can just do it and click through our platform. So our platform is, you know, super open in that regard. Mm -hmm. Um, you can do everything. Um, I just said in the platform, go through a tutorial, kind of develop your own material in a, in a fun way. Um, yep. Yeah. Very cool. Learn well, a I bit about I'm going to go and have a play <laughs> when we're finished yeah. here. Um, okay. yeah, and then you're exactly your 2022 talk here, which is a, it's a, it's a great watch. Yep. Fantastic. Um, I might just kind of wrap up with a, a couple of st standing points. Um, for, but we've just had the, the NF Core Hackathon um, in March, so that, that was online. Um, but we, we have more events coming up in the community. So we've got the, the, the next flow summit in Boston in May. Um, and then kind of looking further ahead, we've got more the Barcelona summit in, in the autumn with, and both of those have their own associated, um, hackathons and more, more training and, and so on. So, so lots of stuff going on. Um, maybe Jacob will see if, see if we can pull you to one of these events as well. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be great. And, and if anyone's interested in your hackathon, when did you say that was your yeah, so unfortunately, probably by the time you hear this episode, it has been done. But mm -hmm. uh, at the end of March, um, it will um, be the Bayesian Optimization Hackathon. It's probably the first one in its world of that kind. Um, so it should be Googleable. Um, it will be promoted on our webpage as well. So you can go and check out the results of that um, 
uh, once you know after this episode and maybe see if someone used the next pipeline we will definitely use the next pipeline <laughs> yeah very cool well, right. yeah looking forward to hopefully we can we can all kind of learn from each other great stuff absolutely great jacob thanks so much for your time thank you for joining joining me today um and it's been a pleasure and yeah maybe we could check in in a, in a year or two and see see how things are getting on <laughs> so definitely yeah thanks for the time yeah. Great. Thanks very much. And thanks everyone for listening. Bye. Thank you.